Hi friends, in this video we're going to talk about five things you need to do to get a good production score on the Duolingo English test. So let's get right to it. Tip number one is to learn how to describe a photo. So on the Duolingo English test you have to describe four photos in total, three through writing and one through speaking, and they each contribute to your production subscore. So if you want to get a good score on production, it's essential that you're able to describe a photograph well. And it's not easy. A lot of my students struggle with this question type greatly because in real life we don't often describe a photo in as much detail as Duolingo wants us to. So to do well you have to practice and I recommend learning a method or a strategy to help you to answer this question type well. I have a method which I teach my students and they find it really helpful. It helps you to organize your answer really well. So let me show you this method right here. Here we'll talk about a simple structure or method you can use for writing about a photo. For this question type, you have one minute to describe the photo in at least one sentence. But I recommend you try to write more than one sentence. So here's a simple structure you can memorize. Sentence number one, you give a general overview of the photograph. For example, this picture shows two young women holding hands in a green field. Sentence two, you can talk about who is doing what or what is where. You can go into more detail here. The woman on the right is taking a photo with her camera and laughing loudly. And sentence three, if you have enough time, you can speculate. Something like, they must be best friends. So I hope you can see here that learning a method like this for answering this question type will help you because you know how to structure your answer and then you can just focus on the photograph you have to describe. If you want to learn this in more detail, I do have a full course covering this. You can find the link below in the description. So tip number two is to speak and write as much as you can. So this one is for the longer writing and speaking questions. You have to do these a few times on the test. For the writing question, which looks like this on the exam, you have to respond to a prompt with at least 50 words and you have five minutes to do so. For the speaking ones, we have read then speak. It looks like this on the test. Here you have to read a prompt or a set of questions and respond for between 60 to 90 seconds. And lastly, we have the listen then speak question type. It looks like this on the exam. Here you have to listen to a prompt or listen to a question and respond through speaking. And again, you have between 60 and 90 seconds to speak. These three different question types contribute greatly to your production score. So if you want a good score in production, you need to do well on all of three of these questions. And an issue I see a lot with my students is that they don't actually write or speak enough. If you look on the scoring criteria here, you'll see that fluency is part of the criteria. And what they are assessing is how much you can write or speak in a limited time. But how much should you write or speak? Well, for the writing question, you have to write at least 50 words. That's the minimum requirement. But I recommend if you wanna get a really good score, you should be aiming for anywhere between 75 to 100. Of course, if you can write more, that's great. Write as much as you can. But I recommend 75 to 100 words. Important to note that even though length or fluency in this case is important, your grammatical accuracy is more important. So when you're writing, even if you're writing a lot, make sure your sentences are grammatically correct. And for the speaking ones, I suggest you speak for at least 60 seconds, but try to speak for the whole amount of time. You don't have to give a conclusion or anything like that. If you can speak up to 90 seconds about the topic, that will help you a lot to get a better score. But for the speaking one, it's important that you stay on topic. That's really important. And I will talk more about that later. A lot of my students ask me how to write or speak for longer. And of course, I have a useful tip for that, which is tip number three, which is to learn a simple structure for the speaking and writing questions. So let me now show you a simple structure you can use for these questions. Questions. And for the write about a topic question type, a good structure would look like this. We have a topic sentence which outlines your main idea or your main thesis of your paragraph. Then you have supporting ideas with examples. I would suggest that you do around two of these supporting ideas and then you finish off with a concluding sentence. Okay, let me show you what I mean by giving you an example. My topic sentence is, I agree that employers should offer longer holidays to increase productivity. This is a topic sentence. It shows exactly what my whole paragraph is going to be about. And I provided two supporting ideas which back up my topic sentence and I gave examples as well. You can read these by yourself. And then at the end, I had a simple concluding sentence. Again, you can read this by yourself. Tip number four is to stay on topic. 
So you need to write or speak about the topic you're given. And this is really important. I mentioned earlier that this is a part of the scoring criteria and the task relevance. So you are actually graded on how well you answer the questions you're given. But more important than that, if your answer goes off topic too much, you might actually get an email like this. If you get an email like this, it says that it was evident that you were reading out an answer. And here, what I think Duolingo mean is that you weren't actually reading an answer at the time, but instead you memorized an answer and you just repeated it during the test. And you can't do that. The Duolingo English test is not a test of your memory. Instead, it's a test of your natural English ability. So if Duolingo think that you've memorized an answer for writing or speaking, and then you just use that answer in your exam, you'll probably get an uncertified test. And of course you don't want that. So it's really important that your answers stay close to the topic you're given. This will ensure that you receive a certified result and on top of that, it will boost your production score if your answers stay on topic and they are well organized. Okay, tip number five is to learn some complex sentences. Mastering complex sentences in English will help you boost your score on the Duolingo English test or any other test like the IELTS or TOEFL because if you can use these complex sentences well, it shows that you have a good grasp of English. Even though you don't speak or write as much on the Duolingo English test as the other exams, it's still important that you include at least one full and correct complex sentence in each of your speaking and writing answers. Remember the scoring criteria I showed you earlier, this one here? The first two points are about grammar. It's talking about your grammatical accuracy and your grammatical complexity. So Duolingo are looking for you to produce accurate sentences, so correct grammar, and complex sentences as well. You want to use a range of simple grammar and difficult grammar, basically. And like I mentioned, to get the highest score in production, you need to use these complex sentences well at least once or maybe even twice in all of your speaking and writing answers. But I see a lot of my students actually avoiding these complex sentences completely because they're a little bit difficult. And it's true, they are a little bit difficult to use, but I think you can do it. It's not that hard if you learn them correctly. So let me show you some quick examples of complex sentences here and I'll show you how you can use them in your speaking and writing answers. So what is a complex sentence? Well, a complex sentence is basically linking two ideas or two simple sentences together. When making a complex sentence, you want to use one of these subordinating conjunctions. That's a fancy word for these words here on the screen. Basically, they link ideas together. So for example, let's say you have these two ideas. Many students like playing sports. Other students prefer making art. Now these are two simple sentences, but you want to make them complex. So you would use one of these subordinating conjunctions. These two simple ideas show a contrast and these subordinating conjunctions are used to show contrast. We need to use one of these subordinating clauses to link these ideas together. Although many students like playing sports, other students prefer making art. The subordinating conjunction is although, and it shows a contrast between my two ideas. Notice here, I did use a comma. So when you're using a subordinating conjunction at the start of your sentence, you need to use a comma before your second idea. You could also put this subordinated conjunction in the middle of the sentence, like this. Many students like playing sports, whereas other students prefer making art. If you put this subordinating conjunction in the middle of the sentence, you do not need to use a comma. Okay, now you need to practice some of these production questions, so I recommend you watch this video here next. I'll see you there. Bye.